Welcome back to a new episode of Dev Drawer. Um, today is going to be a little bit different. I was recently asked to create a video with kind of like a roadmap for a web developer. Um, so I'm going to be going into that rather than focusing on the code tutorials today. Uh, but before I get into it, if you like the video, you know, hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you're not already a subscriber. And uh, let's go ahead and get started. Have you ever wondered what you need to do in order to get a start in a web design or web development career? There's a lot of things you can learn about, but what are the most important? In this video, I'll go over what a web development roadmap should include and why. So let's dive in. Like any job, web development requires the right tools. When you're building a website, you will need a code editor like Visual Studio Code, Sublime, or even something as simple as Notepad++. I would recommend against using something like Notepad because the programs I listed usually include features like indentation, auto-saving, and compiler integration that will help speed up your development. The choice is yours and most are free to use when you're getting started. I use Visual Studio personally because of the features it has. One of the big things I use is the live server extension. This extension allows me to update my code and have it respond in real time on the browser without having to save and reload. You can even set up Visual Studio Code to auto-save every few seconds if you want. This just saves time and effort so you can focus on your code without worrying about updates. The next tool is a good design program. As a professional, I use Photoshop and Illustrator to create the designs as well as the elements of the websites I build. These options are not free, but you do have things like GIMP that could be used in their place. I would also recommend having something like Adobe XD for presentation of your designs since a flat image is usually harder to manage for a client. XD is not required as it is a paid solution and I'm sure there are other programs that are free but having a presentation software is a must for your front-end development. Our last tool that is required is simply a server. You can use either Linux like I use Ubuntu with Apache or you can use Windows IIS. A server can sometimes be complicated for beginners, but you can install something like WAMP on Windows or MAMP on a Mac if you want an out-of-the-box solution compared to a full server. A server is where you will store your files, access your database, and run your code. It is required for any development that uses back-end code, but front-end code can exist without a server, but having one is a better option for when you start developing dynamic code. Let's start with the front-end code since it's the easiest to learn and you can do it without a server. First thing you need to learn is HTML5. HTML is a code that you use to display text, images, and paired with your CSS, the overall look of the website. You can either use a framework like Bootstrap, or you can custom code your own HTML. There are things that you need to account for when creating correct HTML code, but for the most part, it is standardized across all browsers. If you use Bootstrap or another framework, don't overdo it. Bootstrap is a very popular framework and can sometimes lead to boring websites, so either make Bootstrap your own with CSS or build your own framework. Next, let's talk about CSS. CSS implements the styling of the website. It can either be coded in line with the HTML, or a better method is to create and reference a style sheet by creating a .css file. In this file, you can manipulate the look of the HTML with classes and IDs. You can even use CSS to create animations, uh, manipulate SVG files for images, and just overall give your website a unique appearance. Keep in mind that not all functionality of CSS is created equal. Some browsers play nice, others don't. And if you are using Bootstrap, it comes with its own minified style sheet you can edit to make it your own. Lastly, JavaScript is a big part of modern design. You can use frameworks like Angular, Backbone, and jQuery, or you can create your own vanilla JS from scratch. With JavaScript, you can pull code from a server using Ajax, you can make elements move or hide, and you can do math functions. And there's a lot of stuff you can do with it. JavaScript is a key language to learn to be a better developer, even if you never touch the back end. A crucial part of dynamic website design is back end code. A dynamic website is a website that uses code to produce content, either coming from a database or just being hard coded into the website. The most common programming languages used today are Python, PHP, Ruby, Java, Node, C Sharp, and .NET. I know it's a lot of languages and you don't have to be great in all of them, but you can be great in one of them and really good in the other ones. Each language has their own benefits and are used in different ways, so you need to know your project requirements before choosing a programming language. Python is the most popular language for a number of reasons, but PHP is still used on most websites today. For example, Facebook was created using PHP. Twitter was created using Ruby and Java. Instagram was created using Python. So find your specialty, but still learn the other languages. The more you can understand, the better. 
Another big part of backend development is a database. This is where all of your dynamic information should be stored. You do not have to be an expert in database management, but understanding what it does and how to use it will make you a better web developer. Some of the popular database management softwares you should know are MySQL and MongoDB if you're interested in being a Linux developer, or SQL if you're interested in being a Windows developer. There are a few different softwares to choose from based on your project needs, or you can go the flat file route. A flat file database is essentially not a database, but is used to store data in a plain text file. Just keep in mind other databases have relational data. A flat file database does not. It can be faster and more secure for small projects, but should not be used on a large system. Lastly, one thing a lot of developers do not take seriously is security. Website and database security should be a top priority when writing code. When you work with security, you may use tokenization, SSL, and OAuth, just to name a few. When connecting to a database, you have to use security to prevent SQL injection and hacking, or you have to use encrypted strings and URLs. Security is a big concern, it's too big to get into this video, but it is something that should be handled on the development or server level. When you set up front end or back end code, you need a server. A server is where the files in the database will be hosted. You can make your own server or purchase hosting from companies like Bluehost, HostGator, AWS, and even GoDaddy. Your needs for a server are reliant on the project and the type of traffic you will receive for that project. Before you go live with the server, you need to understand the difference between development and production. A development server is where your code is developed and a production server is where your code is pushed to when it's complete. You can also have other layers in between like staging, uh, quality assurance, you know, there's different types of servers that you can set up, but development and production is your start and end points. When you are developing code, you can use Git to manage your code and revisions easier. You can use replication and duplication to move the code from your development server to your production server. And finally, you can use SSH to run commands to accomplish all of this without a GUI. When you are finally ready to publish your website, choosing website hosting is crucial. You need to register a public domain, choose whether or not your website will use static or dynamic hosting, and finally, whether your site can use shared hosting like GoDaddy or VPS like Amazon Web Services. All of those decisions depend on what you need to accomplish, how much traffic you receive, and how big your website files are. A shared server is typically smaller and shared among hundreds of other websites. They're usually limited due to this because your site can affect other websites. A VPS or virtual private server is your own server. It can be spun up and used as needed without potentially harming other websites in the process. You typically have full rights and access to a VPS, but that means you are in charge. One mistake can break a server, so if you have full rights, make sure you know what you are doing. The final thing you need to know for a server are the tools provided with the server. This includes FTP and SSH. FTP stands for File Transfer Protocol and gives you direct access to the server's file system. You can use a program called FileZilla or my recommendation of WinSCP if you use Windows. Basically, you can add files to your server easily using FTP. SSH, on the other hand, is a more direct way to edit your files from a command line. This takes some knowledge, but once you master SSH, you can use a terminal or PowerShell window to manage your files, your database, and even your server. It's very dangerous if not used properly, so before you SSH into a website, make sure you know what you are doing. Now that we've discussed what is required, let's talk about some other tools that are useful when you're trying to become a better website developer in 2020. First, learn Git. I briefly went over it already, but Git is how almost all large companies store their code. They create branches and allow multiple developers to manage code at the same time using development, staging, and production servers. To do this, the Git repo has to be stored somewhere. Most smaller companies use GitHub or GitLab. Larger companies use AWS. GitLab is a free alternative to the paid solution and can be hosted either on the cloud or on your own server. GitHub offers a free plan, but it is limited. AWS is very expensive, so unless you have a large project, it is best to stick to the smaller repos. I also went over SSH and what it does. However, if it was not clear then, you should learn it. You can use SSH to install or remove frameworks and programs using NPM and Composer with a single line of code. This on top of the other actions you can take with it make it a very valuable tool to learn. Lastly, either learn or build your own API. An API is a tunnel to code that produces a result, usually in JSON objects. Having an API is like having a buffer between the client and your database where you can handle additional security, require private keys, and even charge for access. You can easily set up your own API or use an Azure or AWS to quickly generate one of your projects that require it. 
Once you learn how to build or use an API, you can use tools like Postman to test results and Swagger for documentation. In my previous video, I covered Postman and the creation of API using PHP code. Now that we know what it takes to be a better website developer in 2020, what trends are expected in this career? First, motion and UI design is taking over. More and more websites are relying on movement to attract users. Ten years ago, your audience had a 12 second attention span. Now, they have less than 8 seconds. That is a short amount of time to make your website stand out. To accomplish motion and UI, you need to hone your JS and CSS animation code. These two front end languages can create almost any type of movement if done right. Keep in mind that your design has to work on mobile, so don't overdo it with animations unless you make them responsive for all devices and adhere to limitations of mobile internet speeds. PWA or progressive web apps are becoming more popular, especially with Google's introduction of AMP. Basically, a PWA is a small app based on your website that can run offline using application workers. You can create a website and allow people to quickly and efficiently view it even with a poor internet connection. Next up is the popularity of AI and chatbots. Artificial intelligence is being used for advertising ads, and chatbots, like Facebook bots, are being used to directly communicate with end users more effectively. If you're interested in this type of development, Python and TensorFlow would be great tools to look into. Lastly, apps and hybrid development. If you've ever wanted to build an app but don't know Java or C, you can create a hybrid web app. Basically, a hybrid website app takes HTML code and uses tools like Electron or Cordova to build an app from existing HTML code. If you know Java or C, you can always build a native app. The difference is minimal outside of load time and usage. For apps with a larger user base, I recommend building a native experience. For small informational apps, they can be accomplished using a hybrid. In the end, what do you need to know to become a better website developer in 2020? The following is solely my recommendations, but I think it would put you on a better path to a higher income and retention. First, learn Python. Python is the top programming language for a reason. It is a dynamic programming language, meaning that you can use it for web, desktop, command line, and even app development. It ticks all of the boxes for a good developer, and Python developers are paid much more than PHP, Ruby, C++, and .NET developers. A lot of companies are looking for good Python developers, and due to its flexibility, there should be no shortage of jobs. Next, learn Angular or React. These two JavaScript frameworks can help you build a better web or hybrid apps that feel and act like native apps. They were made for this purpose, so if you want to build hybrid apps, learn one or the other. Just my two cents, React or React Native is a choice for most developers as it is easier to learn and has a larger following. Most developers switch to React from Angular at some point. Lastly, again, learn Git and SSH. Not only does it increase your workflow, but most companies require knowledge in both. So I think that's going to do it for this video for today. Um, if you haven't, uh, please subscribe now. Uh, and if you like the video, give it a thumbs up. And um, I'll talk to you next time.